Open world sandbox games are a mixed bag for me. I'm a pretty big fan of games like Yakuza and Grand Theft Auto, but it's less because of the actual open world gameplay and much more so because those games are carried by a very colorful cast of characters and ridiculous situations, and that adds a layer of levity to everything which I find especially charming. Yakuza in particular is fantastic at this, masterfully switching between its highly serious main story to side quests where you're racing against the clock to deliver a pizza to a foreign woman you met because you misunderstood what she was saying due to her accent. On the other hand, I find games that lack a strong narrative foundation make me lose my interest fairly quickly, even if it boasts very tight gameplay and a bunch of stuff for the player to do. I'm a huge fan of Metal Gear Solid. I mean, well, just take a look at my terribly unimaginative internet handle. But despite being a massive Metal Gear Solid fan, I couldn't bring myself to complete Metal Gear Solid 5 at all. It was such a narrative mess, even by Metal Gear standards, that I just sort of pulled the plug on my playthrough. I managed to get to Africa before I got distracted by other games and I just never came back to it, despite reinstalling it on my computer a number of times, and I find that's something I need because, here's the thing, I don't particularly like open world games. I mean, I like them, but having an open world is not a selling point for me. Ultimately, it comes down to pacing, and if a game is able to break up its more serious moments with something lighthearted, or if it offers some sort of compelling side narratives that gets me invested enough to see them through, or if it's somehow able to tell a story that's so gripping from start to finish that it's the video game equivalent of a page-turner, chances are I'll love it. Otherwise, I find that the open world tends to slow the game down a little too much for me, and more often than not, I'll just end up losing interest before I finish it. And that brings us to the subject of today's video, the saboteur. An open-world sandbox action-adventure game released in 2009 by Pandemic Studios, the developer perhaps best known for Star Wars Battlefront. You know, the good one! As well as Destroy All Humans, Full Spectrum Warrior, and Mercenaries, as well as all of their respective sequels. The Saboteur is perhaps the most interesting out of Pandemic's library, precisely because of its theming. You play as a member of the French Resistance in Nazi-occupied Paris during the Second World War, while World War II video games are a dime a dozen, especially during the 2000s, The Saboteur stands out because unlike those others, it specifically isn't a first-person shooter, and you don't play as a soldier. It's enough to put a fresh spin on a familiar concept. But, being an open-world sandbox game, there was the question of how much I would end up enjoying it, considering my rather temperamental relationship with the genre as a whole. The Saboteur sort of falls somewhere in between the two extremes for me. It's a game that has an interesting premise, and it does occasionally show glimmers of some real interesting moments and concepts, but it's also a game that's bogged down by some rather pedestrian writing and overly repetitive gameplay. I like it well enough, but only to a point. The game started out being incredibly fun for me, but by the time the game was reaching its conclusion, I was quite eager to just finish it and move the hell on. Which is a shame, because while The Saboteur is an interesting title for a short while, that is probably best played in short bursts, I find that it really lacks any long-term staying power, despite the fact that it's a game that encourages you to experiment with its systems and create chaos to your heart's content. When you boot the game up for the first time and you're playing with an Xbox One controller, you may notice an inability to select any of the game menu options as the selection icon just keeps scrolling to the right. Or, if you do manage to get into the game and open up the options menu, it will keep scrolling vertically. The game will also not realize you're using a controller and it will show you keyboard prompts for object interaction. Luckily, there's an easy fix for this. Go into your game directory, find and open the input templates file, Find the subheading 360 controller, select and copy everything here, and then paste it over in the settings in the other controller subheading. And now it works like a charm. This fix won't remove the cursor that appears on the main menu in the options screen, but at least you can control the game properly now. The saboteur begins with a burlesque show in a Parisian brothel. Nice. I'm not even kidding about that. The very first scene of the game is a woman performing on stage in front of a cadre of German soldiers. I think that this also might be a good time to mention the fact that the game actually has nudity in it, or at least it does if you got the game on PC. 
see, when the Saboteur was first released, there was a patch available for it on the Xbox Live Marketplace and the PlayStation Live Network that, among adding extra hiding spots, a knife-throwing minigame, and a new car, it would render all of the girls that appear in the game's brothels to appear topless. Nice! Oh yeah, it also included four watchable burlesque shows for your viewing pleasure. You see, the Saboteur came out during a time when AAA companies were really pushing online passes to curtail used game sales. So if you bought this game secondhand on console, you'd need to pay $3 to get the code to give you all of these goodies. If you get the game on GOG or Origin, then the game has all of this included in it already. You can toggle nudity on and off in the main menu at your leisure, though the game makes it blatantly obvious just as to how it wants to be played. Oh, that's more like it. Put the kitties to bed already. Right, now we're in business. Come on, you can always go to the confession when you're done playing. Oh, that's more like it. Turning nudity off just covers up the ladies' nipples with pasties or some equivalent thereof, and it doesn't do much else. The models are still fairly risque. But if you're into hiding the naughty bits, or you need to get footage that won't get flagged on YouTube, then by all means, go nuts. Or, I guess, don't go nuts and... you know what I mean. Anyway, you play as Sean Devlin, a hard-drinking Irish car mechanic turned race car driver, who is based on the real-life William Grover Williams, himself a former race car driver who, after the outbreak of World War II, joined the British Special Operations Executive and helped foster the French resistance in Paris. Sean is pressed into doing a job for the French Resistance one night while drinking in the brothel that doubles as your primary safe house over the course of the game. And right away, this opening cutscene is the first major problem I have with the game and how its story plays out. It sets up Devlin as this reluctant protagonist who doesn't want to get tied up in the events that are soon to unfold, but then it immediately sheds this reluctance as soon as control is given over to the player and you use Sean to wreak havoc on everything and everyone in your path. It's a terribly unconvincing setup, and it only gets worse from here as the game further tries to create dramatic moments that, aside from one sequence that you play through early on, really doesn't feel all that dramatic. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll get more into this later. Visually, the game is... not all that pretty to look at, to be totally honest. Even by 2009 standards, the game looks dated. Low resolution textures and bland, flat faces coupled with some jagged animations makes for cutscenes that feel old, and not in a good way. Environments aren't much of an improvement either. The saving grace here is that there is so much detail in the world that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and that you're unlikely to be off-put by any low-quality individual objects you may run into. However, the bottom line is that the game has simply not aged gracefully in the slightest. By itself, the visuals in the saboteur would be utterly forgettable if it wasn't for the decision to integrate a shifting color palette into the game. Basically, the saboteur uses a contrast of color tones that changes between black and white and full color. This is meant to give the player an immediate insight into just how oppressed a particular city district is, with areas that are liberated being full colored and ones under Nazi occupation being black and white. Honestly, this is the most unique aspect of the game, and I love that it feels reminiscent of movies that are out of this particular historical era. It gives you a sense of credence to the game's plot and setting, and also by being an immediate visual indicator, it streamlines gameplay a little bit, as it doesn't clutter your UI or require an extra button press to see the status of a particular neighborhood you're in. These areas are liberated usually by doing a side mission associated with the characters that operate out of that particular area, which is ultimately the big reward that you get for completing all those side missions. Occasionally, a story mission will also colorize these areas upon completion. Liberated areas make it easier to escape Nazi pursuers, either by reducing the search radius of any Nazis chasing you, or by opening up flashpoints where you can fight back against them alongside members of the French Resistance. By now, you should be getting a sense that the Saboteur plays pretty much like any other open-world game from the late 2000s, trying to replicate that Grand Theft Auto formula. And by that I mean, the game takes place in a vast sandbox that more or less gives you complete freedom in traversing it. And the map in the Saboteur is truly vast. See all those areas out there in the distance? None of that is backdrop. Those are all places that you can visit over the course of the game. The sense of scale in the saboteur is nothing short of impressive, and the variety in different locations does a great job of giving you the sense of exploring Paris and its surrounding areas. 
While the majority of the game takes place in Paris proper, the game will take you across the French countryside to the north and a few of its surrounding cities like Le Havre or Picardy or Lorraine. Seeing the contrast between the heavily urbanized Parisian streets and the sleepy harbor town of Le Havre, for instance, does a great job of instilling a sense of diversity into the geography of northern France. Similar to what Grand Theft Auto San Andreas did with its inclusion of San Fierro and Las Venturas as San Francisco and Las Vegas stand-ins respectively. Speaking of which, this won't be the only time I'm going to be comparing the saboteur to Grand Theft Auto, mainly because it's... it's kind of hard not to. Look, I judge games by their own merits as much as I possibly can, but there's just so much in the saboteur that is instantly familiar to anybody who's played a GTA game that it becomes immediately apparent that, in many ways, the saboteur is another GTA clone, albeit one that feels much more akin to the 3D mainline trilogy, even though it was released a year after Grand Theft Auto 4. In that sense, gameplay is more or less precisely what you expect. You traverse the game either on foot or in one of a handful of era-appropriate cars that are most likely acquired by hijacking them from their owners in order to get from one mission to another mission, while avoiding irritating the local law and or military enforcement. The saboteur includes that familiar 5 rank wanted level that throws more and more deadly force at you the more havoc you cause, and it even includes its own search radius mechanic, taking obvious cues from GTA 4. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, mind you but it does demonstrate just how iterative the saboteur can be. It can, at times, really feel like a Grand Theft Auto game with a World War II skin, albeit just a lesser version. And by that I mean that the saboteur does differ from Grand Theft Auto in a number of different serious ways, but not all of them are improvements. For one, the saboteur has a serious lack of side content. Whereas GTA emphasizes its sandbox nature by allowing you to do a plethora of different side activities, the saboteur has like, three of them. And that's not just me pulling a number out of my ass. You can play a knife-throwing minigame to win prizes, but only if you purchase the aforementioned DLC if you're playing on console. You can go duck hunting, or you can sit back and watch a burlesque show. Or two. Or three. Later on, you can do a time trial in order to participate in two non-story related car races and only two. And that's pretty much it. That's it. That's the list of things that you can do in the saboteur that does not involve doing missions. Well, okay, that's not entirely true. See, the saboteur focuses a lot more on, well, being the saboteur. Its sandbox revolves far more on what it calls free play targets, which are basically a number of Nazi installations spread out across the map that range from sniper towers to radio antennae to propaganda speakers, searchlights, and anti-air guns to things like kicking open resistance supply crates to Nazi generals that you need to assassinate, with a whole bunch of other things sandwiched in between. There's something like 1300 of these things in the game. Wait, hold on. Yeah, 1300! 1300! Jeez, no wonder there's not much in the way of side content. You ain't got time for any of those distractions, you got stuff to blow up. The issue here is that destroying those free play targets is equal parts overwhelming and utterly repetitive. There's just so much of it that doesn't take long for the act of actively seeking these things out to destroy to become a chore, which is twice as annoying since destroying these targets doubles as the way that you earn currency in the game in the form of contraband. Contraband is just an abstraction of the goods that you can use to trade with several black marketeers in order to buy weapons, ammo, and even upgrades that let you improve Sean in a number of different ways. Some story missions even require you to pay a certain amount of contraband before it allows you to progress the game, thereby tying these free play missions into the main gameplay in a fairly ham-fisted way. The trouble here is that this is the only way that you can gather this currency, meaning that the game forces you to engage with this mechanic in one way or another, which makes it far less of a side thing for you to do, and much more of a thing that they very obviously want you to do, and you don't get much choice in the matter. More often than not, there's enough collateral damage done on missions that you always have some contraband on hand. But if you want to unlock the more interesting weapons of the game and get upgrades for yourself, you'll need to start destroying these things. The game also has a perk system that allows you to unlock certain abilities or equipment by fulfilling certain criteria, like escaping a particular alarm level or by winning those aforementioned races. Some of these upgrades are incredibly useful, such as the ability to instantly stealth kill any enemy you manage to sneak up on in the game and others, like the reduced drift when using a sniper rifle, eh, not so much. The bonuses are nice to have, and they do give you a chance to challenge yourself by trying to fulfill these, particularly if you're a completionist, but they are by no means necessary to finish the game. 
you can easily wrap this game up without hunting any of these perks, and you'll do just fine. Some of these perks even unlock after you complete certain story missions, so it's really up to you if you think it's worth trying to unlock them early, or even unlocking them at all. Still, they're a decent enough inclusion to try to get you to experiment with your gameplay at least a little bit. The Saboteur is also a game that strongly emphasizes verticality as opposed to merely driving from point A to point B as you play. Sean Devlin is a regular old Spider-Man, as he uses the ability to scale pretty much any building that you can find in the game. Ledges are highlighted by a white bar and a mere button press will hoist Sean up to the top, which you'll need to do as there are plenty of free play targets as well as the occasional hiding spot for Sean to escape pursuers located atop buildings. Speaking of hiding spots, hiding spots are places where you can avoid Nazi pursuers. There's a number of these scattered all throughout the game, and they take quite a few forms, from holes in ceilings, to public urinals, to random women that you meet on the street. So long as you're under a certain alarm level, these hiding spots will allow you to go about your merry way after watching a small and skippable cutscene. And in tandem with the focus on climbing, they do make the game feel much bigger, and they do offer plenty of opportunities to explore your surroundings. Or, if not opportunities, they at least incentivize you to explore your surroundings. However, once you start to explore the ins and outs of the saboteur, it becomes apparent that the game just really doesn't have all that much to offer, like, at all. And I don't just mean in terms of a lack of side content. I went through the game in about 16 hours, and that included a decent amount of time devoted to completing a handful of side missions and exploring the game. Now, I didn't complete all of the content, but I did destroy enough replay targets in order to unlock most of the upgrades. And also, keep in mind that this number is also inflated due to a handful of mission restarts. So with all of that being said, 16 hours in an open world sandbox game kind of demonstrates a real lack of anything worthwhile maintaining any serious level of engagement. It's a real shame, too, because the best thing that the Saboteur has going for it is that it's open and vibrant world map that encapsulates northern France, and it gives you a real sense of taking a road trip through Europe, albeit one with Nazi checkpoints abound. It's just that as great and as vast as the map is, there's just nothing interesting to do in it aside from traversing through it and doing story missions. And even then, the story missions aren't anything to write home about either. The overall plot is serviceable, but it's certainly not anything memorable. The Saboteur is a revenge story, and Sean's motivations are revealed fairly early in a flashback sequence during the game's first act. Sean and his team went to Germany to participate in a Grand Prix, but after wrecking the car of the eventual villain, he and his best friend are dragged into a secret Nazi base, where his best friend is murdered. Sean manages to escape, he crosses the border back to France, and discovers on that very same day the Nazis have invaded. Along the way, you meet with both British spies and French rebels, and while the game really tries to tie everything in together as though it's an action movie, a lot of it just falls flat with how cartoonish and cliched the whole thing feels. And there's nothing wrong with this per se, there really isn't. Cartoon and cliché is fine, but the quality of the script just doesn't live up to the potential of the game's themes. It tries so hard to be a serious, action-oriented game, but it just doesn't feel like it whatsoever. Sean joins the Resistance in the most unconvincing of ways, which essentially amounts to one character telling him to man up and join us, sucker, and then it's off to the races with a tutorial sequence. And it only goes downhill from there. There's a budding romance that can be seen a mile away, along with a remarkably predictable conclusion therein. Betrayals that come out of nowhere and make zero logical sense in the context of the characters and their actions and how they've been established prior to the reveal. And even characters that are built up only to disappear from the game's plot without any indication of their ultimate fate. It's like you can see the writers running out of steam trying to tie these moments into this big planned conclusion, and them just saying, who cares, it's good enough, and turning the script in because they just wanted to be finished with it already. And now that I think about it, isn't that what I said about how I felt when I was playing the game, and... Uh, uh, just, that's not a good sign. Not to mention that there are times when the game's story comes into direct odds with the actions that you perform in the game. Okay, now, side note, I don't understand why ludonarrative dissonance is a dirty term in some circles, but in this case, it's a very apt phrase to use because the degree to which the game attempts to build up tension by making Sean adhere to some moral code and then making him vocally opposed to committing murder at the behest of British spies is insane. You spend the entire game, up until this very point, gleefully gunning down anybody who stands in your way, including innocents if you so choose. 
because after all it's a sandbox game. But the second that the plot attempts to toss up a moral quandary by suggesting that it may be necessary to kill a defecting German scientist to stop him from aiding the Nazis, Sean's outlook flips 180 degrees. It is such weak writing. And honestly, this is really my biggest issue with the game. Its narrative foundation is built on a house of cards. Character motivations are thin, but given as to how flat most of the characters in this game are in the personality department anyway, it's probably to be expected. For a game that focuses so much on a pulpy story to justify its sandbox, this aspect of the saboteur really stood out to me as something that needed a ton of work. Fortunately, the saboteur's gameplay is a little bit better, but not by too much. You spend most of your time driving from point A to point B, and that's mostly fine. The cars have a feeling of weightiness to them, and you certainly can't turn on a dime. There's a noticeable delay when you turn the wheel, and it makes it feel almost like there's delayed input as the car slowly drifts onto the other lane. It's a very stiff sense of control for most vehicles, with perhaps a handful of racing cars being the only actual exception. However, there's also a noticeable glitch in the game where the audio of the car's engine will cut out once you start driving it at top speed. Overall, this feels alright, although it does feel like a step backwards considering how good Grand Theft Auto 4's managed to make its driving feel a year prior. And, well, GTA 4 also never really had physics quite as fragile as this. This happens constantly with this particular car. Gunplay is another system that's just alright. You have a fairly wide arsenal of weapons ranging from pistols to shotguns, machine guns, sniper rifles, and even stuff like flamethrowers, and of course, grenades. These guns all have different pros and cons to them, so it doesn't feel as if they're mere reskins of one another. You can unlock more powerful weapons as you progress through the game, and once you purchase one gun, it's yours to keep forever. However, you can only carry two different kinds of guns at a time. That means that you're going to need to visit with Black Marketeers if you want to swap out weapons. Missions, fortunately, do take this into consideration and they give you the opportunity to supply yourself with ammo or guns either by leaving them as items that you can pick up while on a mission or by equipping enemy soldiers with them so you can just pick it up off of them once they're dead. It's fairly bog standard that favors utility above everything else. But, and that's becoming a running theme with this video, the saboteur leans a little too heavily into being a cover shooter for its own good. For a game with gunplay that is at best serviceable, the saboteur has a tendency to put you in a lot of situations where you'll be facing down mobs of enemies and the only option is to shoot your way through. It's not a case of where the enemies stand in the way of your objective per se, but it's a case of the enemies being the objective, or at least getting to the far end of the enemy filled area is your objective, leaving your only option as mowing them down. The saboteur attempts to up the ante in gunfights by trying to make areas a little more open, which means that it's really easy to get flanked, and so you need to keep moving for cover. However, cover is precious and it's relatively hard to use effectively. Whenever an alarm is raised, the game will throw more and more enemies at you endlessly and it only stops if you manage to escape out of an area or if you have a hiding spot. This mentality contrasts the fact that the saboteur obviously favors using a cover system to survive gunfights in open areas where it's really easy to get turned into mincemeat by a squad of enemies. Toss in a few explosives for good measure to flush you out of your hiding, and you can see that the game actually pushes you to be running and gunning as much as possible, despite attempting to use basic cover shooting mechanics as a standard for its gameplay. So in the end, nothing ever feels as intuitive as you might expect it to. Its attempt to do both things at the same time ultimately degrades its ability to do either effectively. And so you have a game with a mishmash of long sections, with abundant cover, that is mitigated by its predilection of attempting to discourage you from using that cover by having the AI use group tactics against you. It's a bit jarring when you find yourself in combat, which is really a huge part of the saboteur's gameplay. The only thing worse than these gunfights is the saboteur's equally mediocre implementation of a working stealth system. What the saboteur proposes is good on paper, however it just falls apart when you try to make the most out of it. 
On top of the search radius when escaping, there's also a suspicion meter that you need to contend with. This comes to play if you ever try to enter a restricted area, or if you're doing something suspicious in front of a Nazi patrol. What is doing something suspicious, you might be asking? Well, it's anything no normal person would do. Drawing a weapon, firing a weapon, or climbing a building are all seen as suspicious. When this happens, a yellow circle begins to fill up on your minimap, leaving you with two options. Either stop doing what you're doing, or continue to undermine the very fabric of our collective society and maintain your seditious behavior. If you choose to do the latter, you can either kill the witnesses before they can blow an alarm, or you can brace yourself for some combat. The other way that stealth works in the saboteur is by putting on uniforms left behind by murdered Nazis. Nazis that you yourself have murdered, that is. If you go with this route, Sean will have a circle around him on the mini-map that contracts and expands, depending on what sort of behavior he's undertaking. Sprinting makes the circle huge, while walking shrinks it to the smallest possible radius. Any enemies within the circle, regardless of the size of it, will become suspicious of Sean, thus prompting you to walk very, very slowly around various patrols and take routes around them to get to your objective without blowing your cover. Or in some cases, get as far as the game is willing to allow you to go before putting you in a room where it decides it no longer wants you to be using stealth and it will blow your cover for you, in order to more efficiently enter combat. Oh, and firing a weapon while you have a disguise on immediately blows your cover too. Are you starting to see the issues that arise with stealth in this game? On its surface, much like everything else that this game does, the system is, at best, functional. But functional doesn't mean enjoyable or pleasant. Because of really sporadic guard placement and the fact that you can't really make use of cover on game maps, stealth is rarely, if ever, a truly viable option. I found it so much easier and quicker to just go in an area guns blazing and escape in a high speed chase. When you do it, it's far too easy for the AI to see through you, and considering the lack of any latitude that you get with the suspicion system, you're never incentivized to use it. There's never any penalty for you if you choose to go with an aggressive option rather than a stealthy one. During the missions when you have to navigate through narrow corridors, using stealth is all but useless since it's impossible to bypass guards without being seen. And in open areas, you're limited to where you can go considering that the guards really don't have any patterns for you to follow. And you're really left with trying to just slowly, very, very slowly, dance around them until you manage to get where you want to go. If you're even able to get there, and there are no guards posted by the one door that you need to get past. And this is really the ongoing theme with the saboteur. There is no one thing that it ever does excellently. All it manages to do is accomplish a multitude of things passively. And when you combine all of those things together into a whole, yeah, it works. It works fine. The Saboteur is certainly not a bad game, but it's a game that gets very dull very quickly. There are very few things that linger from the Saboteur. It isn't particularly memorable, or at least not for the reasons a video game should be memorable for, and it isn't exactly an experience that lasts beyond a surface level engagement. When I first started playing this game, I had a bunch of fun. I found the game to be wonderfully enjoyable, but then the weariness set in as I realized just how little there is in this game that makes it stand out from others in the genre. The game's theme is perhaps its strongest element, but unfortunately it isn't enough to salvage it. For me, The Saboteur isn't a game worth revisiting. Not when there are other games that have much more depth, better storylines, better visuals, better gameplay, and pretty much better everything else. All in all, the absolute most that the saboteur manages to achieve is a decent enough experience on a first time playthrough. And even then, I think many people would be hard pressed to see this game through to the end. And really, when there are so many other games that do a similar thing, but they do them much better, why would you want to? Well, aside from being someone who makes videos about these things in their spare time for the gratification of a handful of other people? It's for these reasons that I can give the saboteur only the most tepid of recommendations. It's fun for a little while, and exploring the open world is among some of the most fun I've had in open world games, if only for its setting. It's just that everything else it has going for it just happens to fall by the wayside. It's a case of a game where the whole really isn't greater than the sum of its parts, and it relies far too much on parts that don't really mesh all that well together. Functional, yes, but good? That's a stretch. I think it's really unfortunate that the saboteur marked the end for Pandemic, since I think that they were a studio that truly could have gone out on a much, much higher note. But as it is, well, we'll always have Paris. <laughs>